Okay. Um, so everybody online, thank you so much for joining us today at the HMSC Research Seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffat, and I'm the Research Program Manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon, and I will be your host for today. Um, you will have noticed that your mics and screen share have been turned off, but we've also asked that you keep your cameras turned off for the duration of this event. The reason for that is for some folks that have limited bandwidth, it helps a little bit just to have the one um, to have our speaker highlighted. Um, we do hope that you interact with us via chat. And so I'm sure that most of us have spent lots of time on Zoom, but if you haven't for some reason, um, you can find the chat by either going to the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen, depending on your device, and clicking on the little chat um, pop-out box. And you're welcome to put questions in there at any time. We'd be happy to work through those together. Um, I also wanted to let folks know that this event is being recorded. And if you are interested in watching this event again, um, you're welcome to do so. I'm going to turn that video off. There we go. There we go. Um, I am putting the link to where to find that recording in the chat box right now. Um, and so that's your practice to find the chat if you need it, um, but also that's where you'll be able to find the recording for today's event. It'll take me a few days, so maybe by Monday I'll have it up for sure. Um, one other quick announcement before we get started. I wanted to promote next week's seminar speaker. Um, that'll be February 11th. We'll have Samuel Sarko, who's a postdoc fellow at the University of Victoria, and he'll be talking about kelp forest and a changing ocean. So we get to stay kind of in that um, realm of uh, thinking about how non-animal things grow in our environment. So I'm excited to kind of talk about that a little bit more. Um, if you are excited or you like to learn more about any of the Hatfield events, you're welcome to do so by just Googling or whatever platform you use. Um, check out HMSC and scroll down to the bottom of our landing page and you'll find out um, all of our calendar of events are there. But um, what you really want to talk about today and learn about today is from our speaker. So today's speaker is Dave Thompson. Um, he grew up in the Pacific Northwest and received his bachelor's from uh, Seattle University. And David then went to Southeastern Louisiana University to receive his master's, researching the influence of altered hydrology on wetland plants growing in the Mississippi Delta. After graduate school, David took a job consulting, but quickly found that environmental compliance was not really to his taste. So he began volunteering for San Francisco Bay NWRC they needed help implementing habitat restoration vision document and quickly became clear that the work needed full-time help. So David took a job, wrote grants, and eventually brought in staff to assist with the Habitats program, which he founded with San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. The program initiated restoration across 50 acres and five sites, and in his words, some of them were successful. <laughs> David recently moved to Newport and was hired by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Newport office at the Hatfield campus um, and is focusing on management, habitat management for Oregon silver spot butterflies, um, where he's still getting paid to watch grass grow. And so with that, I'm going to hand it off to David. Thank you, Cinnamon. Yeah. And thank you for this opportunity to share some of my work done with uh, these great people listed on the slide here and uh, a few others. Considering the title and the subject of this, of this uh, talk, I should note that while I'm looking at a stand of Pacific cord grass in the picture, I'm actually mapping plant communities here. It's not a restoration site. The decade of applied research that I am going to share occurred along the margin of the estuary, um, just a little higher in the pedal profile. Just in case anyone thinks this will only be about great science, and there were some moments that seemed great to me. This is really a collection of highlights found during lots of grunt work. Weeding, cleaning, and shoveling. I appreciated them because it got me away from the computer, although I did get tired of trying to mix clays and the saturated paste with pH matrix. And probably the least scientific part of the journey was how it all began. I mean, Cinnamon already covered it. I was really out of graduate school and not thrilled with my first, second, or third job. And I um, found that uh, the San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge Complex needed uh, some help with some habitat restoration. As you can see on these early highlights, that one of the things that's 
once they start, they tend to snowball and people start asking you, can you do this too? And uh, the work grew to the point that it was too much for the part-time administrator at the Refuge's nonprofit partner that ran the bookstore. And so we moved the program to the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. And eventually ended up with about three to five staff and interns working on multiple sites every year. I won't have the time to discuss the habitat mapping projects listed today, but if anyone's interested in supervised classification of remote sensing data for mapping plant communities and or classifying LIDAR data with 3D models of tidal data, let me know. I know a really good GLS developer. Anyways, in the beginning, I just found out that the National Wildlife Refuge, where I live, as we already said, um, needed some help, so I volunteered. And they had what uh, Sidney already mentioned, the vision document, with no practical techniques included. So the last thing the education specialists had tried was to polluting the site with broad spectrum herbicides and scattering grass seed, no seed bed prep. If you tried to restore habitat before, you know it's just not that simple. Now, this is a harsh quote and a somewhat mean-spirited assessment to offer. But when I read it later on, even as a restoration ecologist that did seedbed preparation, I could look in the mirror and say, I didn't know the physics of plant community ecology well enough either. So I had plenty to learn. And even after 10 years of focusing on it, well, I guess I'm somewhere beyond an educated guess. I'm going to start with the physics today and hope I don't lose you on the way to the practice of habitat management in the second part of the summer. I'm sharing theory because I found it was so critical to working with plant communities, how they function. And I also found many who worked in the field didn't apply them much at all. I'd say restoration ecology's primary focus is on plant community dynamics. This is also known as succession. These familiar terms shown here have fallen out of fashion in some respects, but even our revised understanding of them is important to the work. Now the pictures taken here were from a few years of a restoration site at Moffat Field during a Navy base closure cleanup, showing this plant community change over time in succession. The site did extremely well until a nearby salt pond flooded and backfilled this stormwater detention basin, filling many acres of restored plant communities. Now, no worries, we're not going to review the traditional theory of plant community dynamics over time. I just put this up to note that these topics should inform how we manage plant communities. And I will note that there is a new term for climax because since at least 1987, science has recognized the perpetually dynamic character of all plant communities. I'd argue that linear thinking is a problem because plant communities function in cycles. Instead of setting goals on states of vegetation, to try setting goals on restoring, enhancing, or creating process. One practical application of this is including early, mid, and late successional species in your projects so succession can occur on its own. And I'm just going to drive that uh, or add to that point is that we cannot omit ourselves from these dynamics. We are, after all, meddling in their affairs by restoring them. And uh, this subject came up while working with the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District on their restoration of a peak of Mount Omenum. Not by an estuary, but um, there was very few of these projects where I got away from the bay. One of the local tribes claims that it was a sacred site of theirs, so the work included consulting with the tribe. The archaeologist on the project was from UC Santa Cruz, and he said that there was arche archaeological evidence of 5,000 years of indigenous fire management in the coastal grasslands of that area. And just like here in Oregon, on coastal grasslands, if humans don't manage the landscape, and I'll add properly before anyone gets upset, then some things won't exist. And you know, to be honest, we're not the only animals that manage that modify the landscape. And just to drive this point home, if we still look back at the Americas pre-Columbus and think it was a wildland paradise then knowing how much the population were managing the landscape, we need to rethink human management. It's not always bad. And the take home ecology message for me from Charles Mann's 1491 Compendium of Archaeology in the Americas was, quote, 
there is not a neotropical landscape in the world that is not anthropogenic, not even the Amazon basin. So the question that logically follows from all this is this one, but I'm not going to answer it today, <laughs> sorry. I'm going to use a practical dodge instead and ask how do we manage them to maximize their value from the flow environment? And I found one problematic perspective in this regard is that, which highlights our own biases in this calculus, is on plant community guilds. I have shown this picture in the in presentations before and asked land managers what they see. And I'll pause to let you consider an answer, but we don't have time for a poll. Um, their usual response from them was weeds. But this is a historic local native stand of species that was once commonly associated in the Diablo, Diablo Mountains of California. I think our perspectives on guilds has improved over the last decade, but we may still need to admit that we love grasses and often don't appreciate plant communities dominated by flowers. And I like to point out when people have a problem with this is that we have to remember that a grassland is a grass dominated herbaceous community. The only thing that's grass only is a lawn. And there are always forbs around. And when they dominate, we call them forb lands, which always have some grasses. So if we don't have a reference community, or we're not even sure what, our, what a community is, I'm just joking, we do. Then you'd better have some goals to guide your work. The first goal here was given to us by the land manager. Budget is limited and the site is big. One of our guiding principles was feasibility for controlling the budget. And we were always trying to find cheaper ways to make things happen. One of the cheaper ways to make things happen is to let direct competition do some of the work for you. And that's when the natives take up space. And effective means displacing most non-natives. I do not mean displacing invasive species because they earn that title for a reason. But we should reduce their abundance somewhat to make their dispersion more difficult, as many species we see are superior competitors in their own right. These are the species that are early successional. And a reasonable goal would be native dominated plant community that provides the functions and values needed by obligate ecosystem species. We do not need unreasonable weed free grow goals. And active management of invasive species and some weed flare ups is always anticipated. Perhaps even more foundational is what do we mean by functional? Functional plant community. Land managers will often ask you to create the conditions needed by special status species. Our restoration ecology has learned that focused management often neglects the need of the broader biotic community and can miss aspects needed by focal species too. I found this definition hit the important thing. What are the practical application of these goals? Focusing on creating a late successional community can neglect early serial species you want to establish and actually thrive on disturbed sites. They're much easier to get started anyway. They will provide direct competition with regular weeds, again, true invasive species are a separate consideration. And they reduce the management effort in the short term, possibly even the long term. During the secondary succession. Diversity is believed. I believe we know this by now, to improve habitat functions. So the focus on a few late serial dominants may miss the beat aside from not creating functional plant food. Look, a cycle. Of course, we hope the respiration process ends, so maybe this one needs a little bit of work. The key points I found in the process that are commonly overlooked are that plant materials have a very lead long very long lead times. And if you don't give plant materials the time they need, you may find yourself with the uh, temptation to cut corners. Soils should be tested, not an expensive thing to do, just even basic agronomic suitability. And give yourself lots of time. It's not gonna be one year. Budget for lots of visits, maintenance, and you know, use that process to include touch up seeding, supplemental plantings. And uh, if I get through all this fast enough, by the end, we'll be able to talk about monitoring reporting and that, uh, that hook I added right there about data being necessary. 
think we get there. And speaking of plant materials, hopefully everyone is aware of the local species concept. Since nativity is designed by historic residency within a state, the states can encompass vastly different ecoregions. We needed a new concept anyway. But it, all, it has also become clear that the species concept doesn't always apply well to plants, which can have large amounts of genetic variability within surprisingly small geographic areas. So if you aim at conserving diversity, then you have to go local. People have asked me sometimes, how close do I need to stay to a site to adhere to genetic conservation guidelines? That requires a lot of genetic testing work to define each species spatial variability that's usually unfeasible. So turn that question around and ask yourself, how close can you stay to your site with your collection? It takes some effort to do this. It's not as cheap as just buying whatever's available, but that's what conservation requires. One caveat I'll capture here is that you do need to know if a species you want to use is already in the area because this would influence your choices on importing non-local genetic stock. I'm checked. We don't have time for this monstrosity. I apologize. Uh, be some more time. Let's end the theory section and uh, get on to the action. The habitat program that uh, Cinnamon mentioned would eventually lead restoration will contribute to the work of actually about 15 sites in the spoken my bio, most of which are pointed at here on this satellite image. I also contributed to several regional natural resource planning projects, which I will only discuss over big screens, and still sit on a recovery implementation group. I have no And I won't be able to cover everything in the program work done today, but let's see if we can get through the good stuff. As I mentioned earlier, that first site was the Don Edwards San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuges Environmental Education Center's site. And imagine if you had to say that every time you picked up the telephone there. This is not a natural site that was disturbed. It is a capped pre clean act water act landfill in a dike salt marsh that was entirely dominated by weeds. After 10 years of trying to control the weeds, a longtime volunteer said maybe we should plant something. An idea. So they did. And I showed up just as they were about to scatter gas, grass seed again. And I got them to try hydro seeding just off the cuff. And when that failed, it was seed drilling into the soil amendment design shown here with supplemental irrigation. And that drought is still ongoing. Then we found that the geese and the rabbits on the site would still turn all six, six acres into a pudding. There was one significant treatment, and everyone wants to know what T1 is, I know. So the correct way of actually saying this is there was one treatment that had significantly better cover because an unruly volunteer had secretly scattered some seed into one of the treatment areas. Thank you again, Sharon. This was the slap in the face we needed. Here's one of those early cereal native weeds, quote unquote weeds, that love colonizing sites. This is common fiddleneck. And scattered fiddle neck in the background versus eight species of native grasses, grasses drilled into the foreground. Winter. So we took the Wyoming grasses lesson to the bank and came back with a more diverse palette the following year. Eventually, we would be seeding over 30 species of forbs and grasses at other sites as our understanding of the entire plant community grew. Few treatments, fewer treatments this time um, that I won't cover today. And the green areas are hydrosprig testing, which is spraying out uh, rhizomes and vegetative propagation. And the brown areas included some woody species. And this was the last major seeding project on that site. So it's a good indicator of progress, I think. What did we do? I had heard from a hydro seeding specialist that it's an easy method to do incorrectly. And apparently, two pass hydro seeding, which we're doing it twice, is better at bedding seed, for example, you can, you can put um, a seed that likes to be deeper than sown in the lower level, and stuff that likes to be near the surface in the upper. Um, and uh, I have to say about the hydro sprigging that unfortunately this uh, saltgrass sprig showed up not to specification, and they were too long for the pump and cover. And our improvised way of cutting up an entire toad full of sprigs on the spot while the contractor waited may have been ineffective or just been deadly. 
And, but I don't recommend hydro sprigging anyway, because this golf course method of grassland with of grass work um, requires uh, has to stay wet for at least a month for the rhizomes to root and withstand any amount of dry. And irrigation at scale is cost prohibitive. We want to shock an off story about cost prohibitive irrigation. Just ask me a question. But before I paint some rows, give a picture about this site, I can honestly say that not all six acres look good. Some were okay, and some were just bad. And one area they continue to work on to the day. My guess is that soil conditions are to blame for the variance of patterns. And soils are just one factor, so called tip of the iceberg, and all the factors that influence uh, the success of a restoration project. Time to time, I would try to diagram these uh, symptoms. Um, as I tried to figure them out, or to maybe just not forget some of them while we're doing the work. Not sure I was entirely successful. Oh, I almost forgot a few things on this site. At first, well, this was the first site we tried. Um, well, sorry, I was trying to say, this, at this site, we tried most of the direct seeding techniques available. Hydro seeding, two pass hydro seeding, hydro sprigging, seed drilling, broadcast seeding. But we didn't do seed imprinting because it's not applicable on clay soils. And I have to say that even the later sites bore this out, that none of them beat hand broadcasting seed onto good seed bed. The simplest is best. We did this berm in 2011. It was our first hand broadcasting seed area and it did quite well, as you can see in this series. Of and around the time the main seeding areas, California brown and purple needle grass fully established, and we were all patting each other on the back, maintenance mowed the roadside edge, getting ready for a public event. We like to tidy the place up. So we got a glimpse at secondary succession. And the native disturbance oriented species we introduced filled in the gap. That's uh, mostly Western ragweed rising to the challenge. I'm sorry if you have allergies, but it is a wonderful species. And while we're doing all this restoration work, um, there's a lot of busy work in the background. We developed a native plant nursery with the, with the wildlife refuge and we've been managing it ever since. We also developed a micro seed banking facility at the refuge. The nursery development included lots of infrastructure, shade houses, automatic irrigation, greenhouse for propagating out of season, raised beds for amplification of tiny seed collections. One bit of fun was that refuges cannot use chemicals with the signal word danger. And that includes full strength octanary ammonia, which is used to control seeds. So we designed and built a pasteurization chamber to clean small tools at pots by keeping them at 130 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. We also found that we needed a way to store seeds while protecting their viability. Large quantities are always sent out to commercial seed partner to manage, but the smaller quantities we would put into our chest freezer at minus 18 Celsius until needed. Of course, they have to be prepared before they can be freezed. And uh, this development was a lot of fun. We worked with the head of the National Seed Bank, Kew Gardens, someone called Svalbard, and most importantly, a very smart scientist from the Agricultural Research Service you understood the importance of seed lipid content and the interaction of temperatures during drying the storage temps to understand equilibrium relative humidity properly. And then just last little note here, uh, last thing I was working on before I had to leave is there was a mild concern from a phytop flora researcher that seeds might carry oomycetes to new sites. And they wanted to do some kind of bleach dip, but we declined for obvious reasons. And I found a paper on the proper way to decrease all of my seeds for storage. And so I thought if the freezing profile was quicker than this one, it should pull all of my seeds and take care of that. That would be nice. Um, should we take a break? So no, so let's just move on. Next site. Our next big restoration site was the South Bay Say, sorry, South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Projects Pond A6. Farm levees, it's a former salt pond. 
Bond levees have already been breached, so there was no ground access. And we got to hire an aerial hydrocedar that works for the Forest Service. And we also got Moffitt Federal Airfield to donate the use of their airport and um, the water. The accuracy of the pilot was amazing, as his swath width was the same width as the levee remnants. We just man, they top. Then we got two years of drought. Note the uh, bare ground barn on the first uh, round. Plants really need water. It's not a big finding. At one point, I even tried to get Cal Fire to use the site to train for water drops, but they never returned my calls. Certainly, the site did improve somewhat over time, but it never truly succeeded. And I'll spare you the pictures of the bare ground. But we did manage to squeeze some useful information out of it. Nothing earth shattering, just some hard data to inform future design choices. And I'll add one construction note on the project. I wasn't a part of the design or implementation of the earthwork, but I happened to be out near the site and noticed the contractor cutting the le levees much lower than I expected. I let the project managers know and they checked with the designer to agree it was too low, so the contractor was instructed to leave the rest higher. It's good to continue paying attention because something can always go wrong. And speaking of topography, something I found has been a, a, an issue on more than one site. And something about the translation of science into engineering designs and construction there just always seem to be hiccups. And here's a good example. The black and white work is a restoration design, uh, engineering design uh, plan for a gentle slope from the levee to a wetland restoration area that will fill in over time. 30 to 1 was the scientist spec, so they did it. Check. But when we had superimposed the tide zones to show what habitats it would create, we found the transition or upper high marge zone that's marked in red was just terrible. And that was the main goal of the uh, creating the slope in the first place. Someone's always on their phone these days, aren't they? Anyways, if we superimpose that previous figure's blue and red line on a site we were seeding here, you can see that the transition above the red line turned out to be very small compared to what is supposed to be the entire transition that was straw mulch in this picture. Which we had prepared seeded the straw mulch. Part below the red line floated away on the first King Tide series in the winter. Remembering that dirt is a limited resource on large projects, we suggested this variation on their design for that other site. It's about a 20 to 1 slope and it's not as great as 30 to 1, but the habitat zones are much better. Another part of that same site pictured previously mimicked this uh, design change. Incidentally, the old levee road made a much wider area in the transition than the small levee berm in the previous picture, and much, much more of the habitat needed by sensitive species. And much less of our work floated away from this picture. Okay, you're doing great. Two more to go. Oh, we're doing okay. Okay. Another old bay mud site not far from Pond Bay 6 was uh, this site called Pond A17. And these are just the old salt pond numbers. So they're not very exciting site names, but that's what everyone uses. This was restored by the Salt Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project many years before we got the start. And that literally means many years before we were actually able to get funding for it. From the uh, Coastal Conservancy's Climate Ready. Yeah. Um, here, the remnant levees had been mostly turned into a series of mounds to, I believe, isolate the habitat from ground predators. But the mounds um, needed uh, active vegetation management in order to create you know, good habitat on them. And this was the site where the uh, restoration designers asked us to compare wood finds to compost for top dressing because it's cheaper. And they have some very large sites. We compared the two materials and added a third hybrid material that was made by the company at our request, which is just a partially composted wood pines. And we did those at three top dressing depths, and we compared three uh, seed bedding methods, which was uh, straw mulching versus raking in the seed. And we also had the sites still connected to the levee roads, hydro seeding. 
Now, this site was, as I said, already restored, so we didn't have a lot of ground access. So um, we uh, and we didn't have the airplane hydro cedars this time. We did still get to see some great uh, equipment work on the site, and these uh, specialty contractors are still very expensive. And uh, the rest of the areas were tilled and top dressed and seeded with over 20 species. Um, the seed pellet was reduced from that 30 I mentioned earlier to account for the higher salinity of the site. And this was borne out by the test plots which we had run the previous year. Here they are being installed. Was a, this was a critical step in our development of the plans for the site's vegetation management. We tilled and top, top dressed some combinations, seeded, and then we straw mulched using four fiber blankets because they wouldn't blow away. We then found that they were just a little too dense, um, blocking perhaps too much sun. And so we, we took half of them off. And we also uh, collected some of the um, levy material and put it in the nursery in some trays and put the seed mix in that to uh, control for the water here. And we, we saw that, you know, with the rainfall we were getting on these sites, that uh, the uh, old bay months uh, were not going to let a lot of the uh, less salt tolerant species uh, survive. And here's a close up picture of a couple of those test blocks, and then also uh, the uh, test phase in the nursery. I almost forgot to mention the plant materials work. We put a great deal of effort into plant materials from surveying for and collecting as many local species as possible to amplifying small collections ourselves in the nursery or directing commercial collections and amplifications from our partners. We also did all the seeding by hand, all the hand broadcasting, not accessible to the hydro seeder. And uh, you can see one of the straw bales in this picture. Those were a lot of fun to get out to these mounds. And then also a lot of work spreading mulch or raking in seed treatments. And there is always quite a bit of celebration when we finally get these projects done at the end of that implementation period. But how about a little bit of results, finally? Um, this is in my uh, abstract, I mentioned that there was always results that I didn't expect every year. And this is the one I think of the most because I was expecting a compost to perform better than the wood chips because it's more like a soil, but I was wrong. So my revised theory is that the wood chips perform better because they help maintain moisture for the seeds and plants longer than compost. And that's more important than these sites. And in the graph there, you can see the occurrence of natives with compost wane as the summer progresses, but the hybrids well, and for the wood chips um, areas uh, do perform well. And since the hybrid did as well as the wood chips, uh, there was no point to pay even for partial um, And uh, we also learned from the uh, varying the amendment depth amount that uh, uh, one inch was, did not perform as well as two inches, but there is no real point to spending the money on three inches of depth. That didn't improve the depth. And regarding the seed mulching treatment, we found that the uh, uh, hand broadcasting seed performed much better than the hydro seed. And there was no difference between straw mulching and raking in the seed. So this is when we first started to question the uh, necessity of straw mulching for seeding sites, especially when you have a, a top dressing compost, or I'm sorry, top dressing of wood chips to uh, perhaps do the same. It's just a series of pictures um, over a few years from a few of the mounds here. I just have to say that watching plant community succession from year one is a great um, exercise in patience. It's very exciting to see your plants coming up, but don't expect any instant gratification. It's uh, always a little bit depressing. 
unless you get a really great, great flush of early successional species. But eventually these sites we seem to fill in. Some doing better than others, and it's, this is probably another example of soil condition variabilities. I should note that we did um, a little bit of uh, pretreatment on this site, uh, something that's called salinization, which brings salt water onto, onto the ground. We did this prior to seeding as a sort of false spring technique where you try to um, sucker the weeds into coming up out of season before you try to restore the site. And then during the drought, we also used it as a supplemental irrigation technique because a lot of the seeds we put down for salt water wouldn't mind the uh, same irrigation. We used a small trash pump on a wheeled cart. This was run by a small gas engine, a two inch hose and a wild, wildland fire nozzle because metal and salt water don't mix. Well, the final site I will cover today is actually a work in progress, and it would be in its final phase this year if we weren't for the pandemic. After doing a large site like Pond A6 and nearly getting skunked, we decided to split large sites into manageable acreages and then modify our techniques as the years progressed. Phase one was almost too easy. Five acres of upland fills. It was a new site, so no weed seed bank, great seed mix, good tillage. We even did mulching at that time. It was before the other test. And the one wild card that's always there in restoration, it had good weather. Some of the usual fun, as I said, with contractors. The contractor building this site had compacted what he believed was a levee, the pavement, <laughs> because that's what you do with levees, they said. So we had to rip it back up again. And this was a few years in, and uh, by now the shrub component is establishing and really making some habitat complexity, but these sites can be quite successful with uh, not a very complex, complicated. Uh, we've added, we added some complicated methodologies later on as we tried to test more treatments and refine the methods further. This one included refining the wood chip top dressing. We're trying to till it in. We're just comparing it to not tilling it in, varying the depth between one and two inches because these soils were much better than the last site. And putting the grass seed below the top dressing and the forbs on top. And then only raking the forb seed into the top dressing, putting the installment. Planning for these projects requires Calculating a lot of things and trying to figure out how to sequence the contractors, who has to show up when, do what, to make sure it's ready for the other person. Because you can't have contractors waiting. So we get some more action shots, but there's some data. Um, over the years, we've continually refined or played with our monitoring methods and how to present the results for visualizing change. I'll note the monitoring method changes you can reach the end of the Okay. One of the more simpler approaches to present data here was just stack bars. Uh, the three different habitat types we had in few years. And, and this is a nice simple, when you have a simple uh, arrangement, this works quite well. Another presentation method we tried was stack bars showing uh, the range of cover ranks. And the idea here is, is if you look at each one of the colors of each graph and try to visualize the uh, normal distribution of the curve, and between the blue and the green, you can see the curve peak shifting to the right. And perhaps I should add the line of these so it's a little easier to see. And I know there's no error bars in this, and I'll try to get to that by the end of the talk. But um, these uh, results are quite obvious in the field. You can see the ground coming in. And it's almost as if you don't really need data, but we need something to show the people who can't be at the site. 
We also tried doing comparisons between phases or different parts of the site and found that this is uh, quite a complicated endeavor because the different parts of the site were never truly comparable. And so even though if you look at these two uh, columns of graphs, different uh, phases, you might see differences. It's really uh, wasn't a great comparison. And the method that we landed on by the end was these uh, using these pie charts to show the uh, percentage of the different guilds, types of guilds, and then a bar graph showing the um, height ranks because heights of vegetation were a goal for the site because they're required for certain uh, sensitive species. And in case anyone was wondering by this point, if uh, or why I haven't mentioned weeding, but we did lots of weeding. And then there lots of weeding in restoration. We use a lot of tools over the year. Um, I'd say we only use herbicides on the true invasives that are otherwise uncontrollable. Brush cutters and other mowers are good in some cases, but there's something like a tractor mounted, mounted self mulching mulching flail mower to lay waste the weeds. And mostly we did handwork with tools like Blaskies and Maddox and the clouds. There's a lot of it, but it, it doesn't ever a bad time to plug it. And that whole feasibility uh, goal for making these projects as less as much as we can. Uh, we would look at our change in weeding effort over time in the different phases. And it looked like uh, we were making progress. I think the, the more important note here is that just never think that you're not going to have weeding to do, regardless of how amazing your seed pallet is or how good your seed prep is. Sometimes we had multiple years of pre seeding mowing happen and there was still weed work to be done. But with the plants help through direct competition and your own work weeding, you can make progress. Okay, I did mention we get to monitor methods and we have some time. This is going very well. Um, this picture is more to remind me uh, that I don't know how to spell the word discrete, but uh, traditional plant ecology methods for collecting adequate random sample sizes of data for parametric statistical analysis are labor intensive. Five acres took us about a week to monitor. And with the acreages we were restoring, we realized that we'd soon run out of the ability to monitor all. So we were forced to rethink what we were doing. Can we get away with doing it? How many corners can we cut and still collect data? We thought about extremely large scale plant community mapping methods, which are called rapid assessments, but we realized they didn't uh, provide the information that we needed. And so we came up with a a surveillance method over the years that collects what we call the observations because these are not truly quantitative data sets. And we summarize them into metrics that we term things like relative presence or frequency. And we use these to indicate plant community change over time. You can also see in the field. So if you think about it, what do you really need to know about acres and acres of plant community and development? And I think we'll probably agree that uh, not as much as quantitative methods provide. And in fact, we found that the details provided by those really intensive data sets uh, were actually distracting the to see things. Um, this, of course, bothered some of the plant community, call it the, <laughs> bothered some of the quantitative ecologists on staff. It was a uh, protest, and, uh, arguments, but the writing was on the wall, we had to change. So to alleviate their concerns, we tested both methods in the field and found the information content in the surveillance method was totally adequate for describing what we need to know. One quantitative college is still protested, but I think it was just on principle. Now that change was fine. Oops, scroll too much, sorry. Now that change was fine with most of the staff. But when I pitched this idea that you see the picture of discrete ranks where there was space between the ranks, even that was too much for many of them, for most of them. The idea here was to alleviate 
field issues when the cover is close to a rank boundary. You're asking yourself, is that 9% or 11% in the field? And thinking about it. Much easier to say, is that less than five or more than 10? Is it less than 25% or more than a third? And you know, if you looked at the studies on what we can actually perceive in the field visually, um, this is not, this is a you know a fair alteration to make, but it was unpopular with most of the staff. So we never actually used it. We stuck with the uh zero to 10, 10 to 25, 25 basically. So you have to, you can't always uh, make everything work, but we were able to reduce, as I, as you see there in the slide, we were able to reduce one week down to one day, which then allowed us to go back and look at the site multiple times uh, per year. And that was important for looking at the status of the, the structure of the plant community during different parts, um, during the times when it was important for the sense of species needs. This is a slide with a lot of our partners and funders. And Cinnamon, if you want to open it up. Sure. Thank you so much for sharing with us. That was an impressive amount of work that you shared today. Um, so folks, if you have any questions, go ahead and throw it into the chat. If it's easier for you to um, let me know that you just want to ask your question verbally. If you turn on your camera, I can unmute you. Um, but while we wait for that, David, I had a question that's kind of broader and you um, kind of spoke to it at the beginning, but mm -hmm. how common is it to think about um, disturbance in a restoration project? So uh, after we, you know, like if we had a fire um, in a place that we had um, restored, how frequently do we think about that in the seeding process? I was just curious. It was something that you had hit on that I hadn't really thought about before, but this is not my area of expertise. So forgive me for if I'm taking a step oh. rabbit hole. <laughs> is that right? I, I feel like I'm cheating because the position I have now with the, the butterfly habitat management is all about disturbance because you know, these coastal lowland grasses, grasslands um, will uh, go through succession into um, forest eventually. Same thing happens in coastal California. And these grasslands exist, have existed for millennia because of indigenous fire management of the landscape. They created them for their own purposes. And, you know, over millennia, species, other species learned how to use them for, you know, for their own purposes. So, uh, in some cases, disturbance is a requirement of managing the landscape for for diversity. Um, in other cases, uh, I just thinking of the, the preceding weed abatement, the easy way, easiest way to try and knock the weed back, weeds back is by just continually going out and mowing them, you know, year after year, depending on how much time you have before you're gonna, you have to put your seed down. So that's another way. Is that what you meant? Um, I was just thinking about the diversity of seed that you mm -hmm. your mix and whether you plan for the possibility that you want those early successional um, seeds to be a part of that mix on purpose for recovery purposes. Yeah, yeah. So the um, so the a lot of the sites we worked on then were from essentially from scratch, bare ground, and there was no native seed bank if you're lucky enough to have one, and but often you're not. And uh, so we would put down the 30 species was the whole community. So it was the early the colonizers, early successional pioneers, and uh, later serial dominance. Um, sometimes those were annuals, even if they were um, later serial. And um, the early successional species are generally also your, your disturbance-oriented secondary succession species. So they're, they're there for future disturbances. So that, yeah, that's that's what I recommend is to try and look at working with the entire plant community. It's really hard sometimes to find all of them because it's not something that botanists do. And then when we were originally developing our seed mix, one of our, you know, green flags or, you know, bingo lights was if you talk to a botanist about a species and they say, oh yeah, that's everywhere. 
That would be, oh, that's our, that's our, that's our pioneer. We want that one. You know, and there was a lot of like Kaniza, horse, horse weed, and you know, these, these species where they're like, really? Like the seed supplier is like, you want Kaniza? I'm like, yes. On I purpose. Need, I need that. I need that weed, that native weed, yes. So, so uh, yeah, that's, that was part of it. Nice. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of questions come in. Um, so let's just see. I'm just double checking that I don't see any hands or anything up. Um, sounds like we're going to let you off a little bit easy this afternoon. So, um, so thank you so much for presenting and sharing with us. I really appreciate it. Um, do you have, um, or are you able to put in your contact information into the chat box? So if anybody has questions or follow-ups and they're not um, speaking up at this moment that they can reach out to you. Um, and so folks that are online, if you are interested in following up with David about any of his past work or his future work, which he didn't get a chance to talk to us about, um, go ahead and reach out to him. He just put his information in the chat box. Like I said, I'll try to get a copy of this recording up on the HMSC past webinar page in the next couple of days. Um, but I hope that you come back and join us next week. And uh, everybody, you can kind of thank David and just say, yay, thank you so much for sharing us. Um, we appreciate it. And you kind of see those coming into the chat. There they come. Uh, <laughs> give the little uh, quiet applause through our chat. So thank you so oh, much. I appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and end this presentation. Um, but I hope to see you again. Same place, same time, just next week. Thanks, everybody.